Are you saying you, you want to, I'm saying we need to close out the top so we can move forward. Yeah. To the reach. Yep. The major, the major problem to me, when, when I was turning on the reach, first at the FKA round I ever did in high school, it was an equity, it was a similar thing, it was like 25 pounds. The number one thing to me, when we turned on the <coughs> corner, that, that just screaming me as a problem, was that the fairly is much further inboard than it is on the floor. So much further inboard. So you kind of, you kind of literally want to lean out to try to get it outboard to get that shape where you want it to go. But you can't do that if you're big. Yeah, so then you're going to you miss that. A little bit, if you move back, you, you kind of de facto increase, like any kind of hedge you put on is going to start to bring that clue inwards significantly more, and it's going to spill the top over. Now, that may be advantageous if you're super over the top. I mean, 40 knots of wind, that may be the way to go. Well, also, that, none of the crews could see the gym, you don't remember that, because we were all in the space of water. Yeah. But the thing is, I could see it. So you should on it. I know. I was telling Chelsea, but. Rise up and overcome. Right, even, mm -hmm. even, even if you've got the fire hose in right. your face, man, I can breathe. I can see or breathe. <laughs> but <laughs> but generally, generally speaking, you know, <laughs> think about the update to me. Recognize what mode you're in. Okay, and, and Bryce knows all about this because I wrote about it. And we talked about this last time, right? And this, and I'll talk about this right now for bigger region. Anybody know about hall modes? Mm -hmm. And what else? Mm -hmm. Displacement, mm -hmm. planing. What's between displacement and planing? Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. mode. There's, you, we're, talking, <laughs> we're talking about two. There's a, there's a third. I know. I, there are three iterators. What's up? Acceleration and acceleration. There's displacement, there's the forced mode, and forced. there's planing. That's what it is. <laughs> it's a little book I have. Alright. <laughs> Wait. Uh, I'm just gonna walk through this right now for people that haven't that haven't the benefit of this, but this is some of the most important stuff that you're ever gonna hear. It dictates why we pinch in and in FJ and big breeds, it dictates why we pinch in a 420 and big breeds. Right? That has to do with how the hull it, how the hull literally translates the drive of the sales in the boat. Okay? What the fuck is going on? I don't know, there's a loud music going on outside. You can hear it from my money. Alright. So, when a boat's sitting in water, when a boat's sitting in water, it displaces water, right? It, the weight of the boat presses into the water, the, uh, the, dens it, you know, the density of water itself kind of supports with buoyancy, and there's a certain amount of volume, right, in the boat in terms of the submerged region of the boat that displaces water out of the way to allow it to settle in itself. Okay? That static displacement volume, that, in, that entire volume of water, for the boat to move forward one boat length, while it's in displacement, it's got to move that amount of water from in front of it to behind it. Everybody grasping what's going on here? So we have the boat. We have the boat, and here it is at motion. As soon as we start to move forward, the wedge action of the bow starts to push in the water. It compresses the water forces the water to rise up as it compresses it. We have this region of high pressure here, and we get the bow. Right? Kind of acts like a snow plow clearing streets. As soon as it's, as the, as the, as the bow starts pressing forward, we have something else that ha starts to happen. We have space vacating behind the boat. We have space emptying out as, as the stern clears it. So we get water rushing, all this mounted up water starting to rushing you start rushing towards the stern to fill the space. It eventually collides, the, the entire hole fills in, and we have another rising amount of pressure as all that water fills in and slows, and that's the stern. Every boat that sails in displacement creates two waves. You see this on 420s, you see it on opties, you see it on 100-foot tankers. You see it on naval destroyers, you see it on, on animals. You know anything on the top of the water? You know those little stupid bugs that go and do, you know, water bugs and all the rest of that stuff? You see this on everything. It's just basic laws of uh, fluid movement, right? Okay. The bow and stern waves, they travel at the same speed as the boat moves. This is really important because as we know uh, for waves, their speed and their length directly relate. Okay? So let's say that we're moving forward at one knot. 
It's going to be, the wave will only be so long, and we'll get multiple crests of the bow wave. Right? Here's the bow wave's first crest. Here's the bow wave's second crest. Here's the bow wave's third crest. Here's the bow wave's fourth crest. Something like that. Here's the stern wave, and it makes its same crest. Now, you'll notice that I've drawn these waves in, so it's kind of like a, a, a cross-sectional thing. They appear, they, they're generating perpendicular to the center line of the boat. You guys see that? This is exactly how they arise. They dissipate as quarter weight, and the boat continues to accelerate faster. Let's call this a one knot. At three knots, all right, let's call this a one knot. You know, it's, it's slightly, slightly shorter way. At three knots, the bow wave grows, right? And it lengthens, because now the bow, the bow wave is moving forward at three knots. So let's say we only have a couple of crests coming on. Here's the first, here's the second, here's the third. This is boat speed I'm talking about. Not wind, boat speed. At the uh, speed just short of five knots, it's just just below five knots. This is what the formula is predicted. I haven't tested this empirically with the or anything like that. But at speed just short of five knots, we get something magical happen. All of a sudden, the second crest of the bow wave combines with the stern wave, and this is magical. The reason why is because of something I didn't tell you guys previously, right? Why, why is this shape going to be easier to push through the water than this shape? When we push up the wave here on the bow, we have the flow of water, the low pressure filling right back in here. And as it fills in fast, we get a lot of, we got a lot of water colliding at the back and a more intense stern wave, more intense high pressure region. You guys see this? Well, hold on a second. We experience resistance up here as we push into the high pressure. But as the stern wave grows, the high pressure behind the boat, it exerts a forward push. This is how we recover energy. It's, it's why these streamlined shapes are so efficient. You guys see how that works? This is like, this is like an, this is a, an aerial view. Like here's the mask. You see how that works? The longer this is, the, the longer the boat is, better energy recovery to get. Which is to say that, to say that you know, and, and we'll, we'll talk about this, right? But on this, on, this square, on this square object here, we've got this massive high pressure region here, and incredible turbulence arising up here on the corners, right? Water doesn't rush back because it's, 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 you know, it's disturbed up here, and so we don't have as big of a stern wave behind the block. The, the block. Because we don't have as big of a stern wave behind the block, it recovers less energy from the stern wave. It takes a lot more force to push it through. Can you see how that works? So this magic point at five knots bow speed, where the second crest of the bow wave combines with the stern wave to create this huge, bloody stern wave, that's where we maximize our energy recovery for displacement sailing. Up into, right at this point, this is called hull speed. This is where we're getting the most energy recovery out of the stern wave. This is displacement sailing. Everything from zero to five knots is displacement sailing. Ask yourself, where do you spend most of your time when you're, when you're sailing FJs? Spend, you spend it, yeah, I'd say so, but give me a wind speed range. Yeah, I say I say I say well, I'd say zero to like just for upwind. That's just considered upwind. Maybe maybe zero to nine, zero to ten. Assume that an FJ can do at, at best half a wind speed, right? So at about ten knots, it might be doing five knots bow speed. But that that's the ratio that a lot of people talk about. As soon as this boat starts to move forward faster, right? As soon as it starts to go forward at six knots. It starts to push in, it, it pushes in and creates a much bigger, uh, a bigger wave. Because it's now moving forward at six knots. It has to displace a lot more water because it's moving faster, right? The bow wave grows. And as it grows and as it starts to move faster at six knots, its wavelength increases. And so the second crest starts to drop behind the stern wave. We get less energy recovery out of the stern wave. 
which means this boat is now climbing into a steeper bow wave of its own creation with, with less help than it had before from the stern. Okay? Do you guys ever feel like you're sailing at 15 knots in the FJ, you get blasted by a puff at 18 knots, the boat just does not want to go much faster? This is what that is. This is really important. Frank Bethway put numbers to this. In displacement, the best you're ever going to do, if you double your sail drive, the, the maximum percentage increase in boat speed you will ever get is 40%. You have 40% increase in boat speed. In the forced mode, it's like 8 or 9 knots or 420, probably most like more like 11 knots or something like that in FJ. No, this is this is this is boat speed. This is boat speed. Okay. This is force mode. Because you're forcing yourself into the bow wave with less up from the stern. The maximum the maximum percentage increase of speed you get when you double your sail drive, 20%. That's why all of a sudden when you when you're sailing at 12 knots, you get hit with that 15 knot puff, your speed doesn't increase because you're plowing water. You're going straight into that thing. It's why we have to head up in that wind range. Because if we can't accelerate, the best we can do is use the apparent wind lift of the puff to head higher. If, the, if we're tapping out at efficiency at like five knots of boat speed, and, and we try to stay low, then we're not gonna get a, a whole bunch of increase going low. We can use the puff to go much higher. So instead of using speed, we use distance. This shit governs where your technique of wind. It governs VMG angle. I can show I can paint that out with polar curves backwards and forwards, but we're getting it far afield so it's not playing game. There is some critical threshold at which the bows, the bows pushing up its own bow wave. When the force produced by the sails is more than 10% of the combined weight of the boat and the crew. So if we're talking about 500 pounds between the boat and the crew, let's assume a 260 pound crew and a 240 pound boat, we're gonna require about 50 pounds of, of thrust, 50 pounds of drive out of the sails in order to break through this barrier. Depending on the specific contour of the hull and, and how efficient your sails are, how heavy you are, this happens at a different point. But because the FJ does not have a, a, a hull shape that's conducive to planing, doesn't have a flat run aft, to start, to start to flatten the bow wave itself and to allow the hull to generate lift, it takes a lot of speed for you to break through this thing and start to and start to initiate it. That's why I'm saying, you know, it might be eight or nine knots for a 420, it's probably more like 11 knots. I mean, maybe more for an FJ. I, I don't even, I don't think that FJ's, it's been a very, very, very rare experience for me to, to play that. You can surf FJs all day long, FJs surf, but to plane, Surfing is just coasting that wave. Planing is flattening your bow wave and getting the thing to kick. You really feel the boat rise up. You might have. Yeah. 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 I feel like it, you don't feel it in an FJ like you did that. Like, when you sell some fishing. Feel it playing, or even like a yeah, 420 more so. You don't feel it as much in the FJ, but I feel like it's still there. Well, I, I absolutely thought like we could just see it. My, my, point, my point would be is if you're not feeling it, and if you're not noticing that, and I'll, I'll show you the, lit, the, the litmus test of this, right? As soon as you get over this and you start to flatten your bow wave, like here's the splash, the boat kicks out, all of a sudden now, the boat's coming out of the water. It's no longer supported. But it buoy, it's buoyancy no longer supports its weight. What does support its weight is the lift that's generated by passing tons of water over the flat section of the hull. That lifting force, that low pressure, allows, allows the boat to rise. Can you see how that works? It's just, it's just, just like the same thing that we talked about on our wing and, 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 and I think I've seen it on a plane like as efficiently, so you don't notice it as much. You should, you, here's, here, here's the test, here's the test, right? From this critical planing threshold, I'll use like eight knots. Like, or I don't know, maybe 11 knots in the FJ. That, these are just estimations. Okay, I have not measured this. I'm not saying that I have this. And onward, you should be able to plane. But here's the critical test. When you're planing, 
You get a doubling of, of sale drive. You get a doubling in your, in your sale force. You know what your possible conversion is supposed to be? That in terms of your maximum possible increase? 100%. You can double your boat speed to double the sale drive force. The reason why is the faster you go, the more lift you generate, and the more the boat gets lifted out of the water. So the faster you go, you reduce your wetted surface area. You guys ever feel like in a 420 when you're going super fast, the boat's literally flying, so it's skipping on the back end, uh, back end of the hull? Yeah. And if 29er, whatever, it's the same thing. That's what it is, the faster you go. And planning isn't some, you know, like the, the difference between not planning and planning, to just like getting there, isn't, that, isn't a whole ton of speed. The difference is the next time you hit a puff, the boat that, not, that, that isn't planing is just chugging water. The boat that is planing is gone. You see what I'm talking about? Okay. So we have to ask ourselves. Now that we understand kind of the nature of the three modes, if you're sailing in 25 knots in an FJ going downwind, or on a reach rather, what, what mode are you most likely going to be in for most of the time? I, I can almost guarantee you guys, with you two guys sitting together, how much you weigh? 165. 165, how much you weigh? Five. So you guys are 330 pounds together. Right? So, so 330 plus a 240 pound boat, that threshold, that 10% threshold, is further away for you than it is for most people to get the plane. All right, so talk about the crucial drive force requirement, 10% of the combined weight of the boat. I just talked about this five seconds ago. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So chances are you're spending a lot of time in the force mode. If you're spending a lot of time in the force mode, we have to ask ourselves, what minimizes hydrodynamic drag for force mode sailing? What minimizes hydrodynamic drag for, for planning? Two different things. Because they're, they're completely different mechanisms. You guys see that? In force mode sailing and displacement sailing, what I'm trying to do is lengthen my water line as much as possible. The reason why is the longer the water line is, the closer we bring the stern to the, to the second crest of the bow wave, which is dropping further and further down. So there are people who, who in like five knots of wind, or, you know, will sail their 420 and will bow down to a point that their stern's leaving the water. That's not fast. We want to lengthen. We want to lengthen our water line while reducing wetted surface area, right? That's kind of a concern for. That's kind of more of a concern for displacement setting. Confining it to the question we have with the FJ. We've got to not trim ourselves too bow down, not trim ourselves too stern down. How are we going to tell? How are we going to tell how we kind of balance those two concerns? I mean, you've read this. Oh uh, well, I was going to ask a question like, for the. Yeah. The force mode where you're sort of like doing wheelie almost. Like in a power boat, for example, if you're at that point where you're for you're at the edge of the force mode, you almost like you put the trim cast down almost and then you gun it and that you know, you pop up, you go down and then you go out. Do you right. recommend doing that instead of like should we shift our way forward to try and get like to bow down almost? Yeah, uh, what I would recommend isn't it so much shifting way forward as sometimes that ooch oh, gives you the extra shift out. and then we go then we crank it. That would be like the, the ooch in the pump is what pushes you over. Why? Because we talk about that 10% drive threshold. Yeah. And if you just break through, get up, get over that wave, start to surf, and then you're gone. Because once you get onto the point like a power boat, you know you can take your speed down, you can yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. But you need, but you need to be able to stay there, right? Yeah. And, and what's that what's that gonna require in terms of staying plane? So okay. new neutral home, sailing the boat flat, sailing the boat dead flat. Yeah, which is what you struggle with. Yeah, that that's more that's true in, in a 420. There are people that talk about the FJ because the FJ kind of has a little chine thing going on here at, at the back. You guys ever notice that when you take a look over it? It kind of has these two degree angles. Christine Jackson used to tell me that she that it felt fast to her sometimes to either give the boat two degrees over heel or two degrees over heel just to try to start to ride on that surface flat. But it's that fall. Kind of. Imagine this is a cross-sectional. This is not this is not front and back. This is side and side. 
right? Like here's here's the rudder, here's the mast, here's the sails, right? You want to you want to as soon as you're planning, you want to maximize the lift as you're generating off that surface. If you're so dishing everywhere, the lift's going to shit, right? So if the force goes down, let's come back here. What do we want to do? Well, how do we know that we're too too bow forward? How do we know that we're too we're too stern head? Or two way forward, two way down. I should use it. Better. You're not going to be able to see it though, right? Well, that's like what you, that's like what you way too far back. You can't see when your stern is kicking up turbulence, right? You can't see it because effectively, you know, if I'm sitting up here, like here's here's the trunk fort, and my butt's forward on, on the rail, one on, I'm steering back here, and I got the main sheet right here, my crew's forward. I can't check if this position is good visually because as soon as I move, I change my weight position, so I'll never know. Can't do it by sight. Yes, but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a second. We can rely on others in practice to confirm for us, like a coach following behind, whether or not we're kicking up turbulence in the back. And what are we looking for? We're literally looking at the wave and seeing. So, so here's like the water flushing out. Every once in a while, you know, if we're too stern heavy, what ends up happening is we, we're pushing water here. It comes down and then kind of spirals up. It's like kind of turbulence and bubbling in the wake off the back. And you can see it. You can see a marked difference when you move your weight as it's different backwards and forwards two inches. Okay? Here's the thing. You can rely on a third party perspective to confirm for you when this is minimized, and then try to re remember with your pair where's the efficient position. The other thing you can do is listen. Because if I'm too far back, this sounds like a, like a running closet in the back of your You're tripping. You're bubbling. It's not like running water. Kind of have, have to be real zen like focused when it's you can <laughs> no. Let's, let's, I'm sure I'm, if you haven't tried, try it and see if you can notice anything. That will help. How about, how about weights too far forward? I mean, the other thing that happened here is if, if, the, if the knuckle of the bow is lifting free of the, uh, free of the water, then we're minimizing water line length and we're creating more of a problem for us in the first place. Right? So that's nice. Bow weight too far forward, we start to feel an angled nose down. We're like plowing, just like knocking in, knocking in the water. Right? What's up? Yeah, you, you can. You can kind of you can kind of see the attitude, right? You feel like you're getting speed bumps. You were talking about difference in terms of helm sensation. When you're too far back, what kind of helm do you feel in the rudder? Oh, but what kind? It's gonna have a tendency. The boat's gonna have a tendency to turn. But they're like turn up more. It's like a when you're saying that you're too far back, it's sort of like a question to you. Your CLR moved aft. Because you submerge the rudder more and you've taken taken the center board out. So here's the center center of lateral resistance. Here's the center of effort. Uh, maybe then it's just I felt in my experience is you're just exemplified wherever you go. You get lean help when you're too far back. The rudder will start to feel the wants to push in your hand. If you're too far forward, you get weather help. Okay? So that's something that's something we can use. That's that's four half way trim. If we're in, if we're in force mode, we want to try to avoid the force mode to the extent that we can. We want to try to kick into a plane. Sometimes this involves setting a higher course to kick into a plane under and off and whatnot. But this this to me is like one of the major uh, the force mode to planing junction is like the major concern when you're when you're sailing reaches the big one. For the sails, it's it's pretty easy. You just want to avoid salt and buffeting and doing what you can with the sails to manipulate that. If you're a big crew, I would definitely recommend trail these forward and then adjust and trim from there. If you're a smaller crew, maybe trim by hand as long as you can, as long as you can. Right, we can talk about because in trimming by hand, right, the problem with fairly is that it's a fixed ratio for how much the crew gets pulled inboard, how much it gets pulled back, and how much you get pulled, pulled down. When you trim by hand, you can independently adjust all three of those things without having negative consequences in any of them. People are looking at me like they, they've been bombarded once again. Some Do we learn stuff today? Yeah. All right, guys, for for your for your weekend practice and whatnot. For your, Alex, were you at this week's champs this weekend? Okay. If you get your asses kicked, 
and if any single thing, if any single thing goes wrong, and for me, even regardless I won, I, I knew the moments where I was like, shit, I almost lost that. You know, or, or I made a mistake here and it almost cost me, or I made a mistake in this race and I got fifth year, I didn't win it, I could have won it. If there were things that was hanging in my mind, like, man, I need to go back and, and do something different in my training and make sure that doesn't happen again. Identify. And then start begging your coaches to run this shit. Right? The great thing that I'm going to give you guys on Sunday is a shit ton of congestion. That's going to happen in terms of repetition with all of this. You get to see it. The, the, the novelty value goes up. Probably going to be one of the words of Kate. They're going to have a lot of stuff. So if you guys want to check out BBYRA.net, they'll go on the list. BBYRA.net is a course.